The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows is brought to you by the StarQuest Podcast Network and is made possible by our many generous supporters. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash donate. You're listening to The Secrets of Raiders of the Lost Ark, brought to you by the StarQuest Podcast Network and our many generous supporters. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where we will discuss the deeper layers and meaning of the 1981 Steven Spielberg movie starring Harrison Ford. And joining me today on the panel are Mac Barron. Hi, Mac. Hello, everybody. I'm making this stuff up as I go along. <laughs> Shelly Kelly. Hi, Shelly. Hey, Dom. How you doing tonight? Good, good. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Good. So, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. This is the movie I wanted, I've wanted to do for a while, uh, on this show because this was one of two or three of the formative movies of my childhood, Star Wars, Raiders. Um, and so let me start off by asking you all, like, when did you first see this? How old were you? What was the impact on you when you saw this? Uh, without giving too much away about, you know, I don't want to have to ask too many <laughs> sensitive questions, uh, maybe even about how old were we, were you a preteen, teen, et cetera? I, was let's see since it came out in 1981 i was uh, um gosh I, I i was 12 years old yeah um in the summer of 81 and uh i saw it in the uh the little i don't know if it is a politically correct say it's a chinese theater in my hometown <laughs> i mean it, it was it was a chinese theater i guess it's still okay um where they had like they would project clouds on the ceiling and they had little twinkling lights and they had a everything was done in that Chinese style, which you just don't see that anymore. Uh, but it was perfect for watching this throwback movie. Um, and so, uh, I was take, taken, oh, taken away with it. And, uh, I saw it in the next six months. I probably saw it four or five times, uh, at least, um, as a 12 year old. Um, and, uh, it, it was it. It was big for me. Uh, so, so for you guys, you know, when, when, when did you first see this movie, uh, Shelley? Okay, Dom, I'm a few years younger than you. I was 10. And <laughs> okay. I'm pretty sure <laughs> I'm pretty sure I saw it with my father in the uh, local mall. Um, and I remember being very excited about it because it starred Harrison Ford. So Yes. And you're right. It was a, a real formative movie. It was kind of the beginning of the adventure series and mm -hmm. like Star Wars and I'll even say E.T., which was a couple years later. Um, mm -hmm. It's just one of those you, you just remember and it becomes an instant classic. Yep. Father Corey? Yeah, I, I'm even a little bit younger. I was five years old when it came out. <laughs> and I, I probably didn't see it when it first came out, um, but it wasn't many years after that. I, I don't I don't remember when I first saw it. I might have saw it like on, you know, VCR tape or off of, a, you know, network TV back when there were only three networks and cable was just kind of starting to ramp up. Um, so that's kind of when I first saw it was – after it had been through the movie theaters, probably about the time, you know, the second movie came out was probably about the time I saw the first one. Right. That would have probably been on like, you know, ABC Sunday night movie or something like exactly. that. That's exactly. That's how you're or, or, back or in those or days. Rental, that's, yeah. 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 And, you know, of course, rental, you know, VCR rental places were just starting to get going too at that point. So we probably rented it or something. Like I said, I don't remember exactly when, but I'm kind of like you guys. It, it was just, it's such a, a movie that just, especially at that age, you're just like, wow. Right, right. Uh, all right, Mac, you, you tell us. Was it on in DVD? The year, in the year of our Lord, 1986, <laughs> I was 10 years old and my family got a VCR. And the very first VHS tape we rented was um, uh, um, the, um, the guys, the comedy duo. What is their name? The fat guy and the tall guy. Laurel and Hardy. Costello. Abbott and Costello versus Frankenstein or me oh. Frankenstein. Okay. <laughs> but the second videotape we rented was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, that one changed my life. Not so much the Abbott and Costello. I can't remember the names, but, uh, but I saw Raiders and there was no turning back. Now, by that point in my childhood, you see my grandparents had gotten a satellite dish. And for you Utes out there, 
1986 satellite dishes were, <laughs> were much larger than Frisbee's. You could, in fact, yeah. get drunk and pass out in one of these. That's how big they were. And uh, did I mention I grew up in South Georgia? Anyway, we, uh, my parents had gotten a satellite dish, and so I'd already commenced to um, spending all summer long in front of my parents' um, uh, satellite receiver watching whatever HBO had purchased that would just go on a loop all summer long. Oh, yeah. And so I, I had seen Star Wars. I had seen, I think I'd seen Empire by then. I think my brother actually went to see um, Temple of Doom and came back talking about how great Temple of Doom was, and I didn't have any idea what he was talking about, and mm. we rented Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, my gosh. It was a whole new world. It was unbelievable. I, it, it was my childhood. I love that movie. And then mm-hmm. and then it's kind of one of those movies that you forget about as you get older and then you rediscover. Or anyway, I rediscovered about the age of 15. And I think that was just about the time they started re-releasing movies that mm-hmm. like they would have been digitally remastered and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I bought the whole sure. trilogy at that point. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, the only one I saw in the theaters was um, The Last Crusade, and that was huge, huge for me. But uh, sure. this movie, I have gone back to, year, I bet I've watched it just about every year of my life. And if I yeah. ever see a piece of it on, I'm going to watch the whole thing. Well, that's right. Well, that's why I watched it. Watched it again this morning, and it's I'm I'm five years old sitting in front of the TV again. Yeah, <laughs> just the, yeah. the excitement, the joy, you know. I, the I think I, I I love a lot of movies, and I think this is my favorite movie of all time excellent excellent yeah I, this one is up there for me i mean it's like star wars raiders uh, it's it's hard to choose um but the thing they have in common is harrison ford i mean this was <laughs> so, like until this movie came out harrison ford was han solo yep. and harrison ford did that very rare thing of he he created two iconic giant uh, characters mm-hmm. that that to stand astride the, the the film industry. I mean, and they're, Han, and they're Han very Solo, different, and they're very different characters. You can't compare Han Solo to Indiana Jones, not very right. well. I mean, there's some things they have in common, and we could talk about that a little bit. You know, the the fact you know both Han Solo and and Indiana Jones are sort of the lone wolf. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, they have you know Han's got Chewie, but as far as from a, a you know a, a human life standpoint they they're you know they don't have they're not married they're not settled down they're 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 you know footloose and fancy free they're out finding whatever it is that that they're looking for in life um and so this and, and they also sort of play fast and loose with the rules and that's one of the things that 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 was so fun about indiana jones is he sort of changed our view of archaeology from mm-hmm. um you know very studious academics you know brushing dirt off of bones in the ground or you know pottery in the ground <laughs> to you know bull whips and fedoras and, <laughs> and, and i'm, I'm sure know. real archaeologists love that but still <laughs> oh yeah 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 <laughs> um, well, well and it, it's so it's such a I mean, it's really hard to separate my nostalgia from just an honest evaluation of the character. I mean, he wore a fedora and a leather jacket, and he carried a bullwhip. That's he just looked cool. He just looked cool. He just cool. looked cool, right? Uh, and, and the story, if you watch the behind the scenes from, I, I think I, I got them on DVD like 10 years ago or something, and they came out with this great bonus features. And the story, do you guys know the story behind um, like this project being brought to Spielberg, mm-hmm. like right. Spiel- Sp- Spielberg and Lucas sitting around talking about like what their next project was. And Spielberg saying, man, I really want to do a Bond film. And Lucas saying, oh, I got something way better than Bond. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you just, can you imagine being a fly on the wall in that room? Mm-hmm. Right. This is, I don't care how you make this Steven, but you got to have a big ass ball rolling down a cave yeah. after this guy. Right. <laughs> he's got to carry Hawaii? a bullwhip. Yeah. But they just great. Catch him back in Hawaii. Yeah, they were on vacation in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the other thing that was so great about this movie, especially at the time. You know, George Lucas had just, you know, he'd had, you know, Star Wars. He had Empire Strikes Back. Um, He he was, you know, doing the special effects through ILM. He was the big in Hollywood. And Steven Spielberg was the same way. He had Jaws, he had E.T. He was Mm -hmm. a big name. And these two titans came together to make this movie, which was... You know, if we talk about maybe a little bit about the the time period that it came, mm-hmm. this was the very beginning of the Reagan era. Uh, there was a bit of 
the seventies had, had just ended where there was a lot of downer about America mm-hmm. and we were just coming out of that. We're just coming out of recession and America is feeling good about itself again. And there we have this nostalgia bomb of Raiders oh, yeah. of the Lost Ark, a throwback well, to an earlier time. Well, it's very much even the style of movie. I, you know, it, it's very much in the, the genre of like the 1930s, 1940s, Zorro, Maltese Falcon, Errol Flynn, mm-hmm. adventure movies. Comic book. Yeah. yeah. The big, you yeah, know, the these, big these grandiose. Serials. Yeah. Yeah. Big. And that's something that my generation knew nothing about growing up as a child of the mm-hmm. 80s. We didn't have any idea about those things. And we didn't, we, we just didn't know. And so when we saw this, it was brand new to us. And and yet it was a throwback. And yet you've got, like you said, Dom, these two titans that are just having a ball. I mean, that are just yes. recreating their childhood in this new way for a new generation. And they were literally creating our childhoods, mm-hmm. you know? Right. Just fantastic. exactly. Yeah, um, so a couple of things about um, about about that, the, the, the movie itself. I want to kind of get into the movie itself. Um, the the. Uh, the the making of the movie like this this was a time again when special effects were still pretty new like CGI was mm-hmm. not really there yet uh, it, I mean it was it wasn't there at all really um, well, match, was, match overlays and things like that mm-hmm. yeah and practical effects um, and so they when they when they did some of the stuff they had to do it for you know in, in real life and you know they used some movie magic but it wasn't you know we'll just do it in post you know in front of a green screen this was mm-hmm. had to be real effects so i'm thinking of things like just even the simplest like the first shot of the movie you have the paramount pictures logo and then when it fades out to have a, a mountain shaped like the mountain in the logo and they i, I guess I, I read about they spent weeks trying to find a mountain in hawaii that that had that shape <laughs> because that's the only way you could do it is the price. And it had such a, a huge effect on the, you know, just that, that first impression of the movie, like, Whoa, like this is, this is a wild shot. Like the, you know, how'd they do that? Uh, and so it immediately takes us into the movie. Um, and so we, we we're, we're on the ride. Um, a couple of things in that, that first, that first part, that first sequence that we know so well, um, there's a there's a young actor in that that scene who's in his first movie role that we all know. Uh, Alfred Molina plays uh, the character of oh gosh I forgot the um oh uh, what was toss the, me the statue I give you the whip toss me the statue I give you the whip Sapita <laughs> yeah. it's Sapita he, he plays Sapita. the role of Spider Bat guy that's who yes. he is he's Spider Bat yeah. guy yes yeah. yeah, Sapita that's right thank you Shelley yeah uh, you know it, that that scene of I mean so we set the scene we set the, the the pace of the movie right here in this very first scene of that walking through the jungle um there's a lot of tension this this silhouette of this manly man with uh, a fedora and uh, he's got a leather jacket, like you're saying, Mac. And, uh, you know, he's got the, uh, the gun on his hip and, uh, and it's, you know, we, we, we get, you know, this very dangerous situation and you have these uh, um, unsavory characters who are with him. And, uh, you know, that one of them, you know, uh, tries to get the drop on him and he, and this, you know, he, he hears the click of the hammer being pulled back and, Use the bullwhip to take it out of his hand. And you're like, who is this guy? This can't be that archaeologist. He's not some bookish archaeologist. Uh, and it's right from the bat. Uh, you know, what was your, what's your and first then, impression? Wait, wait, wait. But well, then, I mean, well, okay, we can talk about first, first impressions is this guy's as cool as it gets. Right? Exactly. And, yeah. it's, and all of a sudden it's, it's, you think that's the little piece of action at the beginning of the movie, right? Right. It's a little play with the gun and the bullwhip. But then they keep on going through the the jungle, and they find the the treasure, and they run. You know, they they the the, the there's the big boulder scene, and then you're introduced to the bad guy. Like right following off the this first thing with the whole yeah. his control over the natives, <laughs> and the yeah. natives know what that means somehow, right? <laughs> and then and then we're introduced to the fantastic like cartoonish. Harrison Ford run away from the natives like they're literally <laughs> right. like three feet behind him and then he runs over the hill and they're a hundred yards behind yeah. him right <laughs> there's all these natives and they just happen to between the two hills where you see the one hill in the back and the hill in the uh-huh. front and there's nothing and all of a sudden 
everyone. Start the plane. Start the plane. <laughs> <laughs> but then we're the juxtaposition between that scene and the very next one really kind of takes the audience on a ride in a totally different way because we go from them flying off in the plane to right. him riding on a chalkboard, you know? And that's such a sort of mundane, very, very quiet moment. And it, the girls are trying to flirt with him, you know, and then before you know it, we've got Brody coming in, you know, and then we've got, and we've got government men. And then it's just, it's just fantastic. Sort of the ride that it takes you on. It is very much like a serial. Now they might not all be the action serial. Sometimes there's not a whole lot of act, like the college scene, you know, but it, the movie kind of breathes in those moments. So but you don't the, but know the college, what kind of adventure you're on. Ahead, the college Charlie. scene is so important because we're introduced first to this adventure and, you know, he's, he's after this treasure, like it's just a treasure hunter. But then when you see him in the, in the university sequence, you understand how studious he is, how academic, how learned, um, this mm -hmm. is a passion for him. This isn't just a, a career. It's not just a job. He goes to extremes. Um, and it's not just for the money. Right, right. And, and then Marcus says everything's about for the museum, for, for the greater good, for, mm -hmm. for, you know, well, this is, this is a piece for the museum. I can get it. I can get it. I just need, you know, I forget how much money and, and, and tickets to Marrakesh. And you're like, <laughs> Oh, no, that's, that's all great. But I noticed one thing the other day watching the, rewatching the film. And that was that it wasn't just the girls. I mean, I remember being a girl and she'd blink those eyelids. And we'd all be like, oh, can you do that? Oh, how'd she get it? <laughs> but, um, and he just kind of stares like, uh, uh. but if you watch when the, all the students are leaving, even, even the boys are mesmerized by what he's saying. And even as they're leaving, there's a, it's a boy that puts the apple on the corner of the right. desk and it starts right, to roll right. off and Marcus catches it and takes a bite. The most popular professor in all the university. <laughs> what so kind of, you don't, what, <laughs> you've got to have a charisma for that. What kind of brown nose student leaves an apple for the for the professor though? You know what I mean? In <laughs> I that. Honestly, <laughs> think about 1936. What you're saying. So think about when this movie comes out. This movie comes out at the height of the 80s. Everything's about cocaine and skyscrapers and big uh, um, <laughs> shoulder, shoulder pads, pads shoulder on pads, yeah. these enormous big hair, suits. Yeah. yeah. And then what are we looking at? We're looking at a slice of the past. We're looking at Indy. They're all wearing tweed. The next scene, they're in this huge auditorium, and Indy's opening up dusty books and explaining Judeo-Christian, you know, legend to to these government guys, you know. And it so it's such a it's such a change of pace from mm -hmm. everything else that we're seeing at the time and living through. And how many women are in college in 1936? Well, and maybe yet that that's class a finishing is school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, that you, I'm going to guess that, uh, most of them were in his class, uh, for, for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, that uh, old MRS degree, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. They're all trying to be uh, MRS for the prof professor. But, you know, that's the thing about I want to kind of get back to is, is like Indy's motivation is, you know, like the and sort of the difference between him and Han Solo. Han Solo was kind of it was in it for the money most of the time. You know, that's he kind of gave you the impression uh, that mm -hmm. was the money was 90 percent of it. But with with Indy. It, you know, it's he's not just a, a tomb robber. He's not just a, a a treasure hunter. He's he's part of it. He's in it for the the you know to find ancient things mm -hmm. and to uncover them. Although you know maybe the better way is to do the what archaeologists actually do is which is to uncover them within their context and not just take the best piece and run. Uh, but th this <laughs> because I think part of it also is the adventure. I feel mm -hmm. like Indy is in this and we we kind of get a taste of this in um the the opening the prologue for um the last crusade where we see a young Indy on the train uh that he's sort of an adventurer uh sort of fellow and I think he's in it for the adventure you know you know Marcus give me $3000 and I can get to Marrakesh and I can get this piece you know he he wants to go get it like it's just mm -hmm. it's not about necessarily about the 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 academic and the putting a piece in the museum it's about you know going out there and finding it and the being the one to find the it. excitement the energy that comes with with this and you know the 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 fulfillment that really comes from succeeding right exactly fortune and glory kid fortune <laughs> and glory <laughs> so uh, we can't really talk about raiders because i wanted to also talk about uh, you know without talking about 
the music, the John Williams oh, music. Yes. It goes, like again, John Williams, I sometimes say he's like the Mozart for our time in the sense of his music really defines uh, uh, this last 50 years for us, our society, our culture in many ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you hear a piece of John Williams, you recognize it. Uh, and his music in this movie is just, it's such a huge part of the ride. Uh, again, mm-hmm. he evokes uh, older music, music from this classic time of the 30s and 40s, mm-hmm. makes it his own, updates it, and you just are taken along for the ride with it. Whenever that that Indiana Jones theme comes on, I'm like bouncing in my seat like that. <laughs> you know, it is, it is unabashedly enthusiastic. Mm-hmm. Yes. And yes. and heartfelt and sincere and just joyful. And, right. Uh, and not just that, but the the soft themes, the, all the light motifs are just so like. They're not afraid to be. There's nothing emotionally subtle about them. Right. right. And yet mm-hmm. they don't feel exploitative. And mm-hmm. I don't really know how you pull off that trick as someone that sits in a theater li- and leans over to my wife and goes, you think the music's telling us how to feel right now? You, know, <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, you don't get that in Indiana Jones because they're not trying to hide it. He's not trying to be subtle. It's like, let's go, guys. Come on. You know, or <laughs> let's let's get all romantic here. You know, it's all it's all right there. John Wayne, <laughs> my wife likes to say that he 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 wrote the soundtrack to our youth. You know, all mm-hmm. the big themes that we know of our youth are John Williams themes. And he does it so sparingly, like, uh, you know, when you hear dun, 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 like you just like you hear this, like those few notes and, you know, that's. That's the sound of something bad approaching, you know, or the Indiana Jones or, you know, you know, in Star Wars, the Imperial March, all those things have become such a part of the currency of our of our like our sort of common vocabulary mm-hmm. that we all we, we hear it in, in other contexts, uh, you know, and other composers have now picked it up and they use it. Well, and so he definitely is a master of making the music almost a dialogue of its own. It's almost, you know, just as all the all the all the actors have their lines in their dialogues, the music is a part of that dialogue as well. It's it's almost like he wrote music for a silent film. Right. Mm. Right. Well, yeah, you know, which, again, goes back to the, you know, the, the, the old adventure films, you know, mm-hmm. kind of the same thing. Right. And each yeah, person because, has a theme. Yeah. Right. So. Right. So and then so as they introduce this character, it's one theme and the theme can change. And he also uses instruments to convey that same sound. Um, So he's able to adjust it and and go with that flow, too. And there's something wonderful. I think you think about the bar scene when Marion has shooed everyone else out of the bar. Right. And she's like finishing off, finishing cleaning up and the door opens and there's this just the shadow of Indy. And you see the shadow of the fedora, you know, and you hear you hear Marion's theme start to play with that. And so there's this wonderful imagery on top of that score that you Mm -hmm. just go, man, this is a great movie. I love (laughs) this movie. Speaking of sound. If you heard that music piece out of context, it would immediately bring to that to mind that image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Right. But you're going to say, Mac? Yeah, speaking of sound, if we can move on to sound design. Sure. This is a world in which all pistols sound like shotguns. <laughs> oh, right. yes. All punches are haymakers. Okay. <laughs> and all artifacts in good Indiana Jones movies come from Judeo-Christian, uh, if you want to call it <laughs> mythology, but history, yep. right? Right, yep. right. Right. Those make the best Indiana Jones movies. It, somehow they come off the rails when you're going after the occult and they come off the rails when you're going after aliens. But you stick to Judeo-Christian <laughs> stuff. And it's wonderful because because not only do pistols sound like shotguns and punches are haymakers, but God is real and he kills Nazis. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic. We'll get a little <laughs> bit into the, the, the Christian symbols, too. But uh, uh, by the way, there's also. How many of you are, are you familiar with the Wilhelm scream? Oh, oh yeah, of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's in here. There's one of them. The guy gets knocked out of the truck, and you hear the Wilhelm scream. Oh yeah, well, and, throw and that, that in there. guy, and that guy is like three different characters. Yeah, he's, right. He's I think he's one of the Nazis on the truck. 
Mm-hmm. He's the Nazi that gets juiced by the the weird wing plane, you know, yep. that's right. losing gas. And he's he's the big guy that gets knocked over the head in the bar. Yeah. Oh, or, or right. No, no, it's no. Like the gets, same, I think it's the he same. gets shot, doesn't he? Yeah. I forget. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah the, the guy same actor shot. that and plays Marian. like all three. Right. Um, and he plays Marion. No, Marion shoots him. <laughs> 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 So, uh, you know, let's talk about that. You know, let's get into the Judeo-Christian theme. You know, it's it feels like a movie written by someone who has a belief in that sense. Right. Like we know that Spielberg famously, uh, you know, it's very clear he's Jewish. He, he would go on to make Schindler's List, which is a profoundly, mm-hmm. I feel like, I was like, it's a profoundly Jewish film in that it tells the story of the, 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 the plight of the Jewish people throughout oh, the history cool. in the context of. World War Two, uh, just an amazing film. Uh, but it's this feels like a film told by someone who believes it. You know, the Ark of the mm-hmm. Covenant is the artifact for the Jewish people. It's it, yes. you know it it bears. Uh, so let's let's first talk about what is the Ark, um, Father Corey. Can can you give us a little bit on what is the Ark of the Covenant? What is its its place? Well, the the Ark of the Covenant really was the presence of God among Israel. I mean, that's that's how the, the, the Bible describes it. That's why it was built. Uh, it contained. See, now, one thing I want to kind of caveat is it's a move. This is a movie, so it doesn't quite get everything right. But, you know, what they does say is, you know, that this I was, will say to you, good day, sir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, the, the Ark was the most important object in in the Israelite religion, in Judaism. You know, when, when there was the split between the religion, the North and the South tribes, and then it was lost. You know, the Ark contained, and this is this is one of the points where the movie doesn't quite get it right. It just said that it had the tablets, the broken tablets of the Ten Commandments. No, it had the second tablets that Moses wrote that weren't broken. Right. Because if you remember the story, Moses came down from the mountains. They're having their big pagan re- revelry. He smashes the tablets, goes back up, writes up the new ones, and comes back down. That's when Edward G. Robinson fell into the pit, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <Okay>. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, also so it, it contained had, it contained it, manna from the desert, right? right? The manna which from was, the desert, and then yeah. Aaron's rod, which was uh, which budded, which was used the rod that was used to split the Red Sea. Right. Okay. So it had those three objects in there, and wow, it sat in the that. yeah, and it sat in the holiest of holy. Uh, in the temple. So, you know, the, 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 the image where when Jesus dies, the, the veil was split in two. Well, that veil covered where the uh, Ark had been. Of course, by the right. time of Jesus, the Ark was lost. And it was the ve- behind the veil, the Holy of Holies is also the tabernacle, which is yep. that where Catholics get our term for the tabernacle Correct. that holds the body of Christ, the presence exactly. of Jesus among us. And, and in fact, the when you look at the design of the ark, that's one of the things they get right because it's yes. actually described in the Bible. Exactly. Uh, there's two angels on top, and their wings are coming together at to a at a point, and there's a little space in there, and that was they believed that was the pr- in that little space was the presence of God among us. Mm-hmm. It was um, His throne. The ark that was, was His, his throne. throne. Right. Um, and so only the the high priest was allowed to approach the ark. Once a year, once a year, um, to, to bring the people's sacrifices to it, Correct. and and so, I because this is actually this movie, in addition to just shaping how I loved movies, shaped my faith in many ways because mm-hmm. I was so taken by the fact of this real thing and the story of this real thing that I would later on I I found a a Bible it's a New American Bible but mm-hmm. not. Not the Catholic New American, but the oh, like the New American Protestant, Standard or something. New like that. American Standard, yeah, and it's like a illustrated study Bible. So my, I, nice. I worked in a in a Christian bookstore uh, for a while, so I always I became a Bible collector because I'm a nerd, <laughs> I'm a, a Catholic nerd. Uh, but uh, this one had um, like illustrations of the Holy of Holies and of the Ark and all that stuff, and it's and it really struck me that this stuff is real and yeah. that the Ark really did go missing. Yeah. Uh, during one of the invasions of now, Israel. Th- this is another part where they got it sort of right and sort of wrong. Um, and I kind of had to do a little bit of kind of research. So, yes, it did go missing during an invasion, but it wasn't the invasion of Pharaoh Shishak. 
they got that right. They're, that pharaoh did invade Jerusalem uh, about 60 years, 50 years before when they say that said he, or, uh, after, excuse me, it's B.C., after. So about year 926 B.C. instead of the year 980, as it says in the movie. What they think the Ark was lost was during the time of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, which was actually the year 587 B.C. is when the prophet Jeremiah dropped off the face of the earth. Don't know what happened to him. But that's when there was an exodus to back to Egypt. Right. So a bunch of Jews after the Babylonian captivity and all that went to Egypt to escape Babylon. And they think that's when the Ark was buried and lost. So there's an addendum to this story, which is that the Ethiop- Ethiopian Orthodox Church says yep. that they have the Ark, that yep. it's in this church, this which it's hard for your hard person to call it a church. It's a sort of a mud hut chapel sort of thing or mm-hmm. stone building, uh, very humble. But it's inside this building in Ethiopia yep. that uh, only very few of the priests are ever like like one priest that ever mm-hmm. alive can go in at any time. Uh, and so you're not no one's allowed to go see it. But, right. but we got it. It's in there. And they, and they, will, they will show it, but they will veil it and everything yeah. so that no right. one can see it. They'll parade it around. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that, and that's one of the thoughts of where it's at. The other thought I was uh, I didn't realize is. They think that or there's there's a possibility that Jeremiah buried it in Mount Nebo, which was the mountain where Moses viewed the promised land from the other side of the Jordan River. So it's in modern day Jordan is where mm. they, it might also be. Or it could be in Warehouse 13, if you remember that show. I <laughs> yes. loved that show. <laughs> well, yeah, that which, which is show which, to the end of the movie. <laughs> yeah, I think is actually that Warehouse 13 TV show was Probably based off of Raiders. I mean, I, oh, I, I no have that last yeah, scene where you get this massive warehouse full of boxes. You know, and it's funny, Shelley, you mentioned everybody's got a theme. Everybody's got their own light motif. The Ark itself has yes. a theme. And and we get just a glimpse of it in the um, abomination that is Crystal Skull, uh, where, the, where the, <laughs> the box breaks open and you get a glimpse of the Ark. And just for a moment, you actually hear that... Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. It sounds nothing like the noise that I just made, but yeah. you can hear it in your own mind. Right. Uh, what's funny about what you say, well, a couple of things. There's a there's a book that I, uh, was quite popular when I was about 17. I bought it. And I think I read like three chapters of it. But it's called The Sign and the Seal by um, Hancock by Graham Hancock. Didn't look that up at Amazon just now at all. Uh, but it's all about it chronicles him researching where the ark is and the opening chapter is someone being witness to the ceremony in Ethiopia right. and asking why is it veiled and the old priest telling him to protect the laity from it no. right it's Good, the ark which, of the covenant <laughs> which yeah. actually kind of goes back to a scriptural story uh, when David was bringing the ark into right. Jerusalem um it was being carried and it was falling, you know, someone stumbled and someone went to grab it to save it. And the Lord struck him dead. And we're like, yep. well, he's trying to help. <laughs> he's doing. Well, no, no. You like, and the, the idea is, is because he didn't trust the Lord, that, that the Lord would be able to take care of his well, own holiest of holy things. Well, and, you know, it can touch the dirt of the earth. It's the dirt of our sins that shouldn't touch it. Right, right. Right, exactly. Uh, I suppose I heard a different. I heard that homily from someone else. Maybe that wasn't the best homily. Uh, now that I think about, it. I like yeah. yours better. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a little tangential, uh, but Jordan Peterson, his take on a lot of biblical narratives are a little different and, and mm-hmm. come at it from a much more philosophical standpoint. And his right. take on that story is that this is the Jewish people establishing for generations that there are certain lines that you do not cross. It doesn't matter what you think is best. Mm-hmm. This is the rule, and you do not cross that, and that's how our culture stays alive. Exactly. And yeah. that's a really interesting take that I'd never heard before, um, but I had heard about God and the Ark of the Covenant and Jesus and all this other stuff going to Sunday morning service at a little Free Will Baptist church in the middle of <laughs> armpit Georgia all my life, right? And by the time I'm 10 years old and I see this movie I name me another movie from that three or four year time period that blatantly says God is real and he will yep. open up a can on bad guys yeah mm-hmm. and there are good people that 
help find that God is real, you know? And Mm -hmm. so as a little boy, and I know we shouldn't see these movies as these buttresses of our faith. We should be relying on our parents and and the men of faith around (laughs) us and the women of faith around (laughs) us. But instead being a little boy, that's just a TV kid. This was proof, man. This was, I mean, it really did. I mean, we laugh about it, but it really does. Like, I'm sure that that gave me ammo in some locker room playground argument I got into two months later with somebody talking, you know, talking trash about God. I was like, have you seen Indiana Jones? In the, in the Red <laughs> Come on, man. You can't say that's not real. It, the, it did. It showed us that there is good, that there is evil, and God is on the side of good. I mean, and, and that it's a big Hollywood movie telling us that. I, I'm mm-hmm. I'm the first guy to say, uh, I don't like message movies. I don't like like the movie, like people telling me you've got to see this Christian movie because it's got a yeah. message and, you know, or, or you know, we have to talk against this movie because it's a message against Christian. I'm like, eh, it's a movie, you know, whatever. But but there was something different about Raiders that uh, it wasn't a message movie. The movie wasn't about, you know, the uh, God open a can of whooping but on the nazis it was it, it was a, a fun adventure movie oh yeah it happened to to you know to kind of just assume god is real and god's on the side of the good guys and and that was big uh, you know and and let's not ignore that like i kind of mentioned before he god was sort of on the side of the the americans like the americans took control of it and whatever army carries this in front of them into battle they're gonna win hey i guess that means america wins the world war ii <laughs> no Except no 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 we locked because, it up and put it in a warehouse yes yeah, yeah. i mean the very last how frustrating the because last scene is for indy you know, we were so fools. Yeah. Oh, but we were so intelligent because we knew that it couldn't be trusted out there. So we boxed it up and we tucked it away. We got our top men on it. it that's top. that's actually a really good point. Actually, the the idea of it's sort of it, it is sort of an indictment of where we're smarter than God. We, we don't or you know we we're, we don't trust him. Uh, so it's better to just kind of put him put God in a box and put him on the shelf. Quite literally. Oh, and see, I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking that we weren't going to presume that we needed to use this all powerful, righteous power to defeat the Nazis, that we were we were saying we weren't going to use it. We were going to to do it ourselves. And Mm. maybe I'm making Mm -hmm. the opposite argument for you right now. (laughs) No, no, that's that's uh, But that's how I saw it was no one person should have this much power. It's kind of like in the Holy Grail movie, the uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, you know, no one person should have this. It belongs to the world. Right. That's true. And maybe no army should march behind it, you know, the ark, unless you're specifically told by God to carry it like the the Israelites Israelites were. And the Israelites uh, ran into a fault with that because, again, going back to the scriptures, there was a battle they carried the ark into, even though God did not command them to do so. And oops, we just got slaughtered and lost the ark to <laughs> yeah. the Philistines. Right. Eventually right. the Philistines yeah. had a whole bunch of uh, 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 illnesses and their God kept God uh, statue kept bowing down to the ark. And so they got <laughs> rid of it and sent it back to the Israelites. But yeah, the Is- Israelites learned that lesson the hard way. I have to just an aside. The Bible has some very funny scenes, like the the, the statue of the the Philistine god bowing down to the ark. But uh, and then the other one where um, Elisha and the uh, the the priests of Baal and the, and they're and they're trying to like you get him to burn up the offering, and he's like, "Pray louder, maybe he's sleeping." Like, exactly. <laughs> just <laughs> it's, uh, the Bible has some funny funny stories in it. Um, so okay, so we have the ark, and the ark in this movie is not just a MacGuffin. It's a character in itself. I mean, it has a I mean, to kind of use the corny, obvious word. It has a presence in the movie. Um, it has in, in many ways it has agency. It is it has agency over its own f- destiny at the very end. Yeah. Wh- when they when the Nazis open it. And and you think about um, just in a, as a visual narrative. I mean, where do you think Quentin Tarantino got the glowing briefcase from? Right. I mean, it was when they opened, when when the Ark was first lifted out of that tomb, and it just kind of glows on everyone's faces, and then we see it rise up, and we hear its motif. We, we hear that, that swelling music. And then, 
But at that point, there's the presence and there's the awe of everyone around it. But we don't, we still don't, I mean, we know it's something. But I think they, and I've never really thought about it before, but I, I think story-wise, they probably thought, listen, if we just show this thing now, and then we show later all hell breaking loose, it's, it's, it's too much of a jump. And so mm-hmm. they try to give us this weird breadcrumb that as a little kid, it never made any sense to me with the rat in front of it and the, the and the swastika being burned, burned. you know, yep. right. Mad magically burned away from it to, I guess, give the audience this, this, like I said, sort of a morsel saying now you guys just wait. Cause this thing's, this there's thing's some, a lot more important than you think. There's there, a power there, here. Yeah. There, this, this thing is going to do some damage. Yeah, God does not like the fact that the Nazis have put their stamp on the Ark. I yeah. mean, that was really what it was, what we were being shown there. Um, that the Ark had power of its own and, uh, there was a will behind it, uh, mm-hmm. in, in that sense. And so, the, the image of the swastika is a desecration. Right. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of kind of wonky visuals. All right. In this movie, let's just think for a second of some of the action in this, like, like I mentioned before, and this has to date back to the serials. They must have pulled these like movie magic moments where the the natives are just about to get you, and then you run over the hill, and they're fifty yards behind you, <laughs> or that the wall at the beginning in the cave where where Indy's hat falls under there, and he reaches and grabs it. You know, like every time they show the wall, it's still coming down in the same place, <laughs> right? You know, and they're able to run run below the same thing in Temple of Doom. And you think think back now to that scene where Indy and Marion are thrown down into the the egyptian tomb the well of the souls the yes. well of the souls thank yeah. you it wasn't literally wasn't until the last viewing when i watched it with Catherine that i explained to her how the how the um the cobra scene was done like with the cobra that kind of snaps at indy yes because like, it looks so stinking real because <laughs> it is there's a real snake there you know uh, and, but that action in that scene is, so, it doesn't really make any sense at all. How could a billion <laughs> snakes stay alive in the well of souls? Of course. And then, <laughs> and then why would the Egyptians build the walls completely full of skeletons? <laughs> like as, as the, as the large statues crash into walls, it's just skeletons that come out. And again with the music, the music right. that sounds like screams as you see the skeleton with the big snake coming out of its mouth. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, very traumatizing for a twelve-year-old. Uh, some of those scenes, oh, yeah. but but, oh, but not yeah. so much. Like not that I, like I I didn't you know go back to see it. I mean, it, oh, sure, I had a few nightmares, but I was okay. I was <laughs> Indiana Jones. I, I I still, as soon as I saw the snakes, like I hate this scene. I have always <laughs> hated this scene. I will always hate this scene. Yeah. Well, the the <laughs> game, like just to finish it, uh, Mac, about the the way they did it was there was the plexiglass mm-hmm. between Harrison Ford and the snakes, and as soon as someone tells you that. The next time you watch it, you see the reflection actually yeah. in the glass, yeah, yeah, in the pexy glass. Totally. But, uh, you know, that's one of the things I, I, I love. They, they gave him the, uh, the Achilles heel. You know, Indiana Jones mm-hmm. is, is, he's indestructible. You know, we, we, we get versions of that later on in 24 with Jack Bauer, like the, 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 the hero who gets beat and beat and beat. It still keeps going, you know, that just that, but he has this one Achilles heel that, that he doesn't like snakes. And we get that great scene with Jock in the plane and tells him to grow a backbone, uh, yeah. you know, uh, despite what he all, everything he'd just been through. And, and now, you know, snakes, why did it have to be snakes? And Solo, which we got to talk about, about him in a second with the great line, ass, ah, very dangerous. You go first. first. Yeah. And it just, but it's, just but it's so much humor. Yes. The snakes, the snakes are foreshadowing because mm. the snakes represent the evil. And when they when they're opening up the well of souls, Ooh. remember there's that lightning. I mean, the whole sky is going oh, nuts yes. with lightning. I mean, it, 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 it's almost like the veil is torn. It's that rendering that that mm-hmm. just that very visual display. And then that that they open it and it gasps. If you remember when they pull right. that stone up, there's that <gasps> kind the of air. Yeah. Yes. And so then it's full of snakes. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> uh, there's there's lots of different things that we could talk about about how um, Marion apples there's apples all over the movie they're eating an apple in the beginning the student puts the green apple on the table when Marion's captured later in the um, tent with Bella he right. there's apples Bella, on the Bella. table right and she's dressed how in white, in white. she's dressed yes. in a white dress that could be like a bride and then yeah. she's thrown down there with 
with uh, Indiana and they're surrounded by snakes. So wow. let's let's make it explicit while we're talking about that. And so what we've got is some Adam and Eve imagery, Garden of Eden, mm-hmm. uh, that um, the temptation they're being tempted by, you know, there's a temptation of evil to the knowledge that is forbidden. And the knowledge in this case is the ark itself. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, and and it, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if there's a wonderful scene where Indiana is talking with the French archaeologist, Belloc, and um, they're saying in every time that Indiana is talking about the ark, it's with reverence. It's with awe because he's mm-hmm. saying, y'all don't know what you're, you're, you're dealing with. This is this is a major piece when he's talking to the government men. But then when he and Belloc are talking, he says, uh, I think it's Belloc that says it, that archaeology is our religion and we've both fallen right. from the pure faith. In other words, we're always seeking the truth. Mm-hmm. Right. And yet now we're both our, our skills and our knowledge is being used for something not pure. Um, and he says, don't you realize what the ark is? It's a transmitter. It's a radio for speaking to God. So they, mm-hmm. they have a lot of reverence for these, for this presence, for this But Belloc's artifact. reverence, Indy's reverence is knowledge. And Belloc's reverence is power. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I go with that. And so yeah. anyway, that's that's kind of what I, I remember most about it being just yeah. it wasn't anything to be played around with. It was very serious. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. Bill, I was going to just tell you if, if we could uh, you go ahead, Mac, I'll let you uh, go on, on that. Well, this, this this is a this is a different direction. So you go ahead. Dom. Well, I was going to I was going to take us in a different direction and talk oh. a little more about Belloc uh, and just about that character, you know, his. I feel like he's he's using the Nazis as much as they're using him. Mm-hmm. His his aims are I feel is he wants to control the ark, you know, and right. right down to that very end where he puts on the the vestments of the Jewish priest and mm-hmm. goes to this Jewish ritual to open the ark. Now, he's not Jewish, he doesn't believe. For him it's like magic or right. you know, it's it, it, you you or it's a recipe. You say you say the incantation and the yes. magic thing happens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And 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 it's, so he's trying to. He he knows that there's power here, and like you said, like you said, Shelley, or or Mac, he wants power and to control it. And of course, you can't you can't control God. You just you don't you <laughs> you, you 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 know you bow before him and you and you 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 surrender yourself to him, which is in a sense what what um, both Marion and Indy do in that moment is they sort of you know. They close their eyes and submit themselves to 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 the will of God in that moment because there's nothing else they can do, um, and and in a way by closing his eyes, he's you, you know Indy's religion is knowledge. He's closing his eyes to the knowledge of what's really like. Right. Yes. He must have really wanted to see what was going on. Oh, right. Yeah. And and uh, anybody go to mass this past week? Uh, <laughs> no. I might have. Not at all. <laughs> all right. Well, the uh, the first reading. <laughs> Was Moses, you know, addressing this new generation of of Israelites? And remember what he says: Who in the history of the world right. has ever seen this? Who has seen God speak out of fire and lived? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and and then you think back to the end scene in this movie, and it always gives you chill bumps. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I love oh, how you pulled that together. That was beautiful. And as the uh, as the, the 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 spirit figures come out of the 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 ark, and they're beautiful, and then it turns, you know, and that's yep. the that's what evil is like, right? Evil it 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 it, it attracts us, you know. We mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, oh, come follow me, and then it reveals itself at when it's too late for for you yep. know for us to save ourselves, and we see how ugly. You know uh, that it can be our our own sin and our own uh, evil in that sense, um, and it, and then we see them melt like candle wax yep. <laughs> or explode, um, <laughs> which are still, you know, just uh, the images that that stick with they're you when great, you're twelve. And they're you, great practical effects, and yeah. They've, yeah. they've held up remarkably well. I mean, yes. you know, they're not nobody's going to be fooled and thinking that's real, but it's something that they don't see. It's something that you don't see, right? So and, in this frankly, movie, they in this movie they melt like wax, and then in the Last Crusade they disintegrate. Right, right. It's That's almost like the same. Age. Yeah. Right, but it's it's very similar styles of of right. death. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm. In fact, I'm. That's one of the things. Is like, I don't know. Like, I don't think you could remake this movie today, and it would have because it's it's something about the practical effects, the real, you know, the mm-hmm. the real feel to so much of it that that CGI doesn't have. Like, you know, Avengers: Infinity War is full of you know all these crazy creatures and all things, but it's you know, you just it doesn't. There's that uncanny valley. It's it's not real. It's it's CGI, and this feels looks. Like something right. is happening in a real space, um, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the 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 less real face melting or, you know, some guy getting dragged behind a truck, you know, uh, yeah, on the ground. That was the exact scene I was thinking of. You know, how would they recreate that today? They yeah. probably would do a lot of CGI with something like that. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, these set pieces. I mean, that's the other thing is about the again, the pacing of this movie with, with we go from, you know, so the the the. There's that down period where Indy and Sala are in the uh, the room with the old wise man who I just love him. He's just so great. The old wise man. You take back five for the God whose so whose arc this is, you know, that that whole scene. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and did the poor and monkey. The wind the, blows. Yes. Yes, exactly. That the power of God, of God again. Yep. And uh and then the uh, monkey bites it uh, literally yep. uh, bites the date and dies. Poor monkey. Poor Nazi <laughs> monkey. Uh, and uh, oh, I did read about, by the way, the monkey. It took them like six weeks to teach him to do the, the Nazi salute. The, right. the Nazi, <laughs> which is just hysterical. Um, but from that moment to when Indy and Sala go to the camp, that is like a relentless pace. It's boom, 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 all the way through to when we get to the ship. Uh, where they're loading the ark. I mean, mm-hmm. you, there isn't a moment to breathe there, but it doesn't feel overwhelming. It's perfectly paced, right? Um, and you just one thing after another happens, and it's it it's just a you know some of the best film <laughs> you know ever yeah. ever put on celluloid. Well, you know, uh, and of course, we talk about the bigger characters, but you know, talk about John Rice Davies in this. I oh, mean, he's great. He just you know talk about chewing up scenery. He's just he's phenomenal. When he and Legolas in, in this movie are yeah, exactly. trying to exactly. outdo each other. I was, I was trying to fantastic. think something off of that. Yep. <laughs> and then they have to slide to the next uh, world after that. Uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, well, the, I, action, so the action in this movie, there's something about the violence that mm-hmm. is, uh, I, I think it's insidiously childlike mm-hmm. in that, like I said, all the punches are haymakers, Right. Right. And people get shot and people get chewed up by blades, yeah. but it never it's never gory. Right. It feels crunchy, but not yeah. brutal. Right. And I don't know how they pull that off. And I guess that again, that's probably a throwback. But mm-hmm. there and you you mentioned earlier and I want to take issue with it. But I, but the more I think about it, the, the more I think you're right. Indy is pretty indestructible, but it doesn't mean he doesn't pay for it. Exactly. Right. You know, there's that wonderful scene on the ship, on the little freighter, where <laughs> Indy is hurting all over, and it's used as this amazing intro to a love scene that pulls back just when it gets uncomfortable for parents to watch with their kids. Right. Yes. And it's Did- it's sweet and cute and sexy all at the same time. Yes. And it sa- it actually says something about the character of the people as Indy's kind of complaining, and then he kind of realizes what's happening. You know, well, it doesn't. <laughs> It doesn't hurt here. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really, it doesn't really hurt here. You know? yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. Well, he's, he feels kind of awkward. Like, like Indy is this, you know, this great superhero figure, but when it comes to like other people and women, especially it's very clear so far that he's really bad at it. You know, yep. well, you know, we get the backstory of, you know, that he kind of, he failed with Mary in, in the past. Like he, he mm-hmm. screwed up somehow with her and, and badly, uh, in that he sort of doesn't even notice that the girls in his class are you know, flirting with him, and he just he's he's not good at this stuff, and 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 so we get to this, and it's kind of awkward and cute and endearing uh, to see this this scene. Although I love the with the mirror and whacks mirror. him in the face, he screams. Oh, yeah. Did you say oh. something? <laughs> <laughs> well, he just, had a relationship great. with her back when he was studying with uh, Abner Ravenwood and he left her to go off on an adventure. And, and if you hear, she says, I was a child. Um, So Mm -hmm. she was probably a teenager and he was very likely in his graduate studies and Mm -hmm. off he went and just never came back because for him, 
the relationship wasn't the thing. It was the adventure. It was the knowledge. Right. It was seeking. Hey, fellas, so, I think somebody's probably got a drawer full of fan fiction that's been written on this. I'm just saying. Yeah, I exactly. Well, find the box. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're right. We did write a lot of that before it was even called fan fiction. Probably in middle awesome. school. Awesome. So, but yeah. but do, it, it is clear that there was a relationship. She does say she was she was a child. So she was. And he obviously you know, hurt her very, very deeply because this wasn't yeah. just a, well, we, we're, we decided to go our separate ways this was a he dropped her at the altar type of her no, yes. I, mean. I read it somewhere in a novelization of the movie and i could probably walk away from this recording and go find the book that's <laughs> <laughs> i mean i probably still have it in a bookcase upstairs but uh, i know i read that um so it's got to be well, a novelization i owned it's all the novelizations yes. no, it, it fits then, so. it fits the characters it fits Everything that's said in the movie. So, I mean, it absolutely fits. I mean, Speaking it really Speaking of characters, the the forgotten bad guy of bad guys is the little German guy with the Tut. round glasses. Oh, oh, yeah. Tut. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, well, what and if- like, he has, he has one of the greatest, oh my God, something awful is about to happen moments where he brings out the little rods. You know, he <laughs> yes. walks into where Marion's being held. He brings oh, yeah. up the little rods yeah, yeah. and he flips around and it's a coat hanger. Yeah. Uh, like, well, I was how, no ever, how has no one ever parodied that yet? How how is that not in an Austin Powers movie? I don't know. Well, like in the fact, hand, oh, that freaks my kids yeah. out when he burns his hand. Oh man. Yeah. Well, well, and what a great a great gag to, that that's how the Nazis got a hold of the directions, but they only got half of it because it was burned into his hand. Like, like what a great idea that was to, yeah. to, to, to that sequence of mm-hmm. of thoughts. Yeah, you know, the hanger gag was actually something that Spielberg put in his earlier movie, uh, nineteen forty one, and it was oh, supposed to be sure. Christopher Lee was was a a Nazi officer who was going to interrogate a country bumpkin played by Slim Pickens, which is I I. I, I I was too young to see 1941 so but uh, uh i can imagine how that went and so there was going to have this the same thing with the torture device that turns to be a hanger and that the um the audience test audiences didn't find it funny so they cut it and so he he's like no it's still good i'm bringing it back and of course <laughs> it's one of the most memorable things in the movie yeah. so spielberg trust his uh his instincts i uh, have one problem and and this shows you how much i love this movie i only have <laughs> one problem with the whole movie that if that submarine had <laughs> submerged at any moment, yes, we would no longer have Indiana Jones. Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out. How did how did Indy ride this submarine? You know, sneak inside there and not get found. Right, right. He, he can hold his breath for a very, very long time. Uh, the, actually, the idea is is that the the World War II submarines did not tr- generally travel submerged. Right. Uh, they generally traveled on the surface because they ran on batteries. And otherwise, they had diesel engines, and you can't run right. a diesel without oxygen. Uh, so they would charge the batteries and stay on the surface as long as possible and That's only right. submerge they as only, necessary. They could only submerge wow. for like an hour or two or something like that. I mean, I it wasn't no very idea, long at though. all. That makes a lot of that. sense. That's right. That makes a yeah. lot of sense so considering the U-boats were- on the coast of America. During the war. Right, exactly, exactly, and that's and so there was there was a deleted scene that showed him clutching the periscope. In fact, I think I saw it once in in a version of the movie, whether it was a TV version or something, where or it might have been a the graphic novel version of it. But anyway, he's holding <laughs> on to the periscope. I've I've seen this in so many different ways, holding onto the periscope as it travels through the water, um, so it never went all the way under. Uh, so they they would submerge enough to just have a. Um, a periscope and the uh, snorkel, snorkel. Yep. Uh, above the water. Uh, mm. So, but that's a, that's a long distance for him to be holding on to. Like, even then that's still pretty superhuman when they show them on the map, the, the travel yeah. of the sub. Oh, and speaking of the map, I mean, this, what this movie did was give us like this, this visual vocabulary, mm-hmm. you yes. know, that, that we did not know up until this time. And now it's so hackneyed. It's everything. So derivative. Now there's almost mm-hmm. nothing new. And this was brand new to us. Our generation right. in the eighties that had never seen the serials. We'd never seen the glowing map before. Right. Well, in fact, you know, if you think about it for the time, you know, what, what it showed on that map was what an epic journey he was on. Cause look at those little boats, uh, Air the boat planes, boat the planes. Pacific Clipper. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I mean, those things, they could not fly all the way across the Pacific Ocean. 
they would have to fly to Hawaii, refuel, fly to the next little island, you know, uh, Midway Island or something like that, refuel, et cetera, et cetera. And they couldn't make it the whole way. You know, we're used to now if, you know, if you want to fly to Australia from the United States, you get on a plane in San Francisco and you kick back, relax and you enjoy the in-flight entertainment and meals and you take a nap <laughs> and 15 hours later, you're in Australia. Actually, I'd rather take the uh, Pacific Clipper because then you could land, get out, walk around, exactly. not be between you exactly. know two people in the middle of the middle seat. <laughs> exactly. But it, well, I mean that idea, the map with the glowing dot and the line has become such a, a, an indelible part again of our visual vocabulary that if you own a Mac, you have iMovie, and in mm-hmm. iMovie, ha- you can do that in iMovie now that he introduced that a few years ago in one of the versions. <laughs> and I'm like, that is the best thing ever. Like I can be Indiana Jones. I went on vacation to Maine, and I and I drew a dot from my house to the place in Maine we went. It was awesome. You know, it's like it. so many things, like, like just like Star Wars and some of these other iconic movies of the era, it introduces so many things that we just take for granted now as part of mm-hmm. our, our culture. Um, so we've talked about Miriam. We've talked about Belloc. We've talked a little bit about Sala. I, I really love Sala as a family man. Like he's mm-hmm, got yeah. this giant passel of kids and it's unapologetic. It's not, you know, it, it's, it, there's no, um, Sort of, oh my gosh, you have seven kids. When do you have time to sleep? Or yeah. and, and and the other hundred thousand jokes I've heard uh, as a father mm-hmm. of five. Yeah, you know, it's just like it's it this is you know, Sala is this big, jolly uh guy and who's who's loyal to to Indy and such a great character. Um I'm trying to well, think you gotta, you gotta love that scene with the kids where Indy's basically gonna commit suicide by Nazi. Right. And the kids come running in, <laughs> Uncle Indy, Uncle Indy, Uncle Indy, Uncle Indy. And so haul let's, off. Well, so let's the actually United States Marines. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, like, let's talk about that scene in the marketplace. You know, the where where uh, Marion gets kidnapped and Indy thinks she's she's dead. I mm-hmm. mean that that running through the streets of 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 uh, Cairo like that. Have, have any of you ever been to? Um, Disney World's uh, Epcot World Showcase. Yes. So they have like a, a Morocco nation there and they have these little streets. And I remember in high school, we, we would take these uh, Catholic youth group uh, mm-hmm. trips to Disney World and going with my buddies and we'd run down those little streets going, Indy! Just, you know, like yeah. the, just, just, I mean, this is such a <laughs> such a, a iconic thing. Well, it's, but, it's, it's, it's very fitting for the region that it, it's – placed in because you go even to modern day Israel and there's so many places that look like that. Right. It's very old world. Very. And and so we have this again, another iconic scene where he's been fist fighting and chasing and he encounters this giant dude in black with a sword, the size of Indiana scene. Jones. Awesome. And, and, you know, he's swinging it around and all this other stuff. And Indy just pulls out a gun and shoots him. And it, and it sort of takes me aback a little bit because now, it's like Indy shoots the guy. It's well, the Han. It's the Han Solo move mm-hmm. of the movie. Is now, right. I don't, I, it's the I, look I on his this, face too. Yeah. Well, yes. I heard this years ago, and I don't know how true it is. Um, it might be you know fan fiction again, or made up, or whatever. Supposedly, on the day when they were filming that, Harrison Ford was having some intestinal distress. And he needed to hit the facilities now. And, of course, that was the scene that they had to film. And that look on his face was Harrison's look like, I'm going to get this scene done so I can go to the bathroom. And he pulls the guns out and shoots. And, of course, it's got, you know, the caps or whatever, the blanks. And the actor that's doing the sword was smart enough to just drop and everybody else reacted. Yeah. And it was just like, perfect, done. Done. Right. The, you know, the extras were reacting to the to the to the improv improvisation as yeah. opposed to that, that, that totally was what we were told to do. I've heard the same was, thing, Father. Because I, I, I think it was to. supposed to be I think the original was supposed to be like somehow the whip gets involved. You know, of course, you know, he, yeah. you know, I'm sure there's probably a, big, a little it was a big elaborate hacking. fight scene. Is what right. It was. He was supposed to be chasing through the market uh, with the sword. And then as just as you about to. To, to hit Indy with a death blow from the sword. Indy ducks and the swordsman mistakenly and conveniently chops meat that they're in, at the butcher shop they're standing at, you know, uh, yeah, and that, that gives thing, yeah. Indy enough time to get away from him. Uh, but this, yeah. this was better. You know, this is, yeah. you know, a and little you know, bit of, you know, it's one of those where as soon as they filmed it, the, you know, Spielberg looked at everybody else and said, okay, we're done with that one. That's Ian's right. done. Right. <laughs> 
So is, is there anything else? Uh, let me see if I, in my notes here, there's other things I want to talk about. Um, there are there are a couple of cast members. Uh, I was watching the credits yeah. that I'm going to mention their names. And I, I think some of you will recognize their name. Uh, the assistant to Steven Spielberg in this was Kathleen Kennedy. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. Star Wars Episode Seven and later producer. Yeah. She's yeah. Yeah, head of Lucasfilm now. She's uh, running Lucasfilm. Disney. That's right. Yes. Yeah. One of the uh, illustrators for Industrial Light and Magic was Ralph McQuarrie. Right. Who was mm-hmm. illustrator, conceptual artist for Star War- the original trilogy of Star Wars. Uh, he actually worked on Rogue One. He also was a visual consultant for Star yep. Trek for the Voyage Home. So uh, these are and these are oh, that's people awesome. that, these are people that were well Ralph McQuarrie was a little more established of course because he had worked on the four Star Wars mo- or the the first two Star Wars movies by the time this came out but Kathleen Kennedy this was probably the start of her career she was really starting in Hollywood at this point and now right. look where she is now <laughs> well speaking of Ralph McQuarrie so uh, he he was on the film but the um, George Lucas, like he did with Ralph McQuarrie, he he asked, asked him to create before they ever started production or pre-production. He'd asked Ralph McQuarrie to to draw up some concept art for Star Wars. It was not this was a new thing, kind of. It wasn't mm-hmm. done, I think, as as a matter of course. I think, and he did the same thing with Raiders uh, with an artist called Jim Steranko, um, and so he he created these four paintings to sort of set the. the the tone and it's you know Indy uh in with a in front of a cobra Indy standing in the desert in front of a Nazi uh the jeep mm-hmm. uh Indy punching out the pilot and then uh Indy jumping from a horse to the truck and mm-hmm. these four images sort of set the idea the tone for uh for Indiana Jones now the the guy that Steranko drew is you know is about it looks more like the rock than he does Harrison Ford, <laughs> but nevertheless, it sets it. And what does it says? It was inspired by among other influences, Humphrey Bogart in treasure of the Sierra Madre, mm-hmm. uh, doc Savage, the pulp magazine, um, and a production still from the 1937 film Zorro rides again, mm-hmm. uh, where Zorro jumps from a horse onto a moving truck. And that defined Indiana Jones, the hats there, the jackets there, the bull whip, you know, the, the whole thing. Um, uh, he he is smoking in this one, and they, they eliminated that. I think pretty much for the movie. I don't think does Marion. I think lights up. Marion does, but I don't think Indy ever does. But Marian, speaking yeah, of the, one of the Nazis, I think too. Yes, yes, uh, Tot does. So I don't know if you know some of the other people who was who were considered for the role. Uh, Tom Selleck at one point was yeah. was set to be Indiana Jones, and this was about the time of Magnum PI. So mm-hmm. he was he was a, a name. Um, that would have been interesting. Uh, and I think it would have been good. Actually, I kind of like the idea. Uh, does, anyone remember, well. does anyone remember Richard Chamberlain? In, oh, yes. And Alan Quartermain. And like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Wasn't, wasn't that Richard Chamberlain? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, also in Shogun. Uh, yes. No. But Shogun was not the worst possible copy of Indiana Jones you could imagine. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And Alan Quartermain and the and Solomon's Temple of Gold or whatever it was yeah. it was yeah. a complete ripoff. It was awful. <laughs> well, other derivative stuff. Um, the Tales of the Golden Monkey. Did do you remember that TV show? That was Bruce Boxlight, and I'm pretty sure. Oh my gosh! Um, World War II, South Pacific. He was flying a uh, uh, a you know a seaplane. Uh, among the, uh, the 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 South Pacific Islands, there were Nazis. I mean, again, it was a totally a, a rip off or inspired by uh, Indiana Jones. That that whole uh, 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 shtick. Um, gosh, I after that, I was like, if I ever bought a plane, it would be a seaplane. You know, what I mean, Just, <laughs> I, I was an impressionable kid. I whatever was the latest thing was the sort of thing. Um, another name uh, that was thrown out there at the time was uh, David Hasselhoff, which really would have been interesting. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but ha- Selleck was the one they wanted um, and they offered the job to him and he had to say no because CBS wouldn't let him out of Magnum P.I. Uh, you know, he mm-hmm. had to he had to be committed to that. And that's when Spielberg suggested Harrison Ford as sort of a quick replacement. We got to get a guy. So let's pick that guy that you worked with on those movies, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> and. <laughs> The rest is history, of course. I mean, that's wow. so many movies have been like that. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of anything else that we didn't cover that we should have covered. I mean, there's so much, so many good 
scenes. I'm looking at my ver at my various notes here. Um, so many good lines. The the uh, the map room in Tannis. Such a great gag, you know, a, a great uh, bit that that they did mm -hmm. there with the the light coming in. If you put the staff in the right place, with the light right. coming through. Well, I love um, it too. I, I I never noticed it until this t watching it today. Not just did the Nazis have it the wrong size, they had it in the wrong hole. Yeah, yes. I saw that too. Because the hole was too up from where, because you can see Indy puts mm -hmm. his finger in the hole where they had it. Right. And then he moves it back two spots and that's where he put it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I always with, wondered, how did he know that? Right. He, I, he had some notes. Well, and the thing is, is the, because the sun moves about during the day, although Cairo being close to the equator, it's not as dramatic as it is here in North America, mm -hmm. but it would move throughout the year. The sun would be in different places at different times of day. So you'd have to be in it. it you'd have to figure out which hole is the right place for today mm -hmm. as opposed to another day. And that's one of the and maybe they had done it several days before. And that might right. have also been why it was a different hole. But it somehow I don't doubt that for a moment. But I see Indy <laughs> standing on a submarine and I go, nope. Not, not, <laughs> they didn't think that out. They just did the thing. That's true. Uh, head cannon. Head cannon. Yep. Um, uh, another, uh, just another, like a great uh, piece of evidence that you know how how much effort went into this in a pre CGI day when they filmed that scene from Sala's house looking out over Cairo. You know, if I remember seeing even like actually when I was a kid, well, like National Geographic talking about this, Cairo in the eighties, every rooftop had multiple. And TV antenna. Mm -hmm. And of course, in, in 1936, 37, ah. there would be no TV antennas. They had to go out and physically remove all the TV antenna from all those roofs because there was no CGI to do it. I mean, just the movie, how different movie making was. Now, those did they days. film that in Cairo, though? I thought it was in Tunisia. I'm sorry, in Tunisia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, but it was the solo in Cairo. But yeah, yeah, they yeah. filmed that. Nobody that part. likes a show off, Father Corey. Yes. Well, so yeah. <laughs> no, you make uh, the correction. <laughs> um, so, by, by any, the way, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. Any, anything else? I mean, anything we've missed? Um, you, maybe about the ending. Um, you know, we we have to get we you know we have to kind of figure out how Indy got the arc back from that place of disaster where the where the, uh, where the the wrath of God descended on the Nazis and how we got it back to America. We, that's kind of left unsaid. Just imagine he got got there somehow a whole hmm. nother half of the adventure um, uh, and they get it home and they present it to the government and the government takes possession of it and locks it away. It, it, like and like we said before, you know, it's too powerful. Like nobody should touch it. It's 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 a weapon of mass destruction. Well, and you you wonder what your feeling walking out of the theater would have been had you not have John Williams score to make you happy again. Right. Because if you if you think about that scene without the score, that's a really I don't know if you call it dark turn, but uh, definitely melancholy. And that's definitely a not downer. melancholy. And yes, yeah, a down. It's a total downer. And it's just go. That's awful. You know. Right. Um, but then as as you pull back to the mat painting, you know, you start hearing, dun, 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 and you think, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, all right, I'm good, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in a way, isn't it true? I mean, Indy almost never gets away with the object that he's seeking. Right. You know what I mean? The There's the grail or the ark or the, the little head at the beginning of this movie, you know. The he, he he never seems to come away with the with the, the piece that he really wants. Mm -hmm. But at the end of this, he comes away with Marion, you know, who is the one he probably should have stayed with in the beginning. I mean, if that if we if we're looking for a sort of a a, a message at the end, mm -hmm. um, he he does win in a way by ending up with Marion um, and defeating the Nazis. Um, so I I guess I mean it's, it's, uh, so. Let's you know sum it up. Uh, we're, we're, this is a lot of fun, and I, I'd like to do this again for um, at least for um, the next one, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Mm -hmm. um, just because you got to do the Temple of Doom, even though that scene, the dinner scene, is really the grossest thing on film, and uh, <laughs> for me, and uh, 
<laughs> and, and, but if, but in the last crusade, we'll we'll make a decision about Kingdom of the Crystal Skull at some later point. D- disclosure: um, I have not I, I have not watched that because I've heard the reviews of it are so bad. <laughs> I just like now nah, I don't want to ruin it for me. I, I I like Indiana Jones as I've seen it in those three movies. I don't want to ruin it. I don't think we should dignify it with an episode of Secrets of. Okay, that, 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 that's good. Hey, have any of you seen the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, mm-hmm. which I, I never I got to, to see that. because we didn't have the Disney Channel when I was a kid, mm. and so I was I was deprived, and I I yeah. wanted to report my parents. I thought uh, it was on thought, ABC or CBS. Uh, it was on a channel I wasn't getting, I guess, or something, or or maybe my parents told me it was on Disney. I think Channel it was like on ABC it. or something like that. I can't remember. It had to be. I didn't have cable growing up, and I saw him on the. On the- ABC was owned by Disney, or was it the other way? Uh, a- ABC was owned by Disney. Remember, they they used to have the Wonderful World of Disney. Right. Oh, that's yeah, right. It was they had a relationship. It was ABC, but it was, but Indiana Jones was still Paramount at the time. And I, I think at this time, mm-hmm. uh, ABC wasn't owned by Disney like it is now. Yeah, that that but they had a relationship. But yeah, Indiana Jones was on uh, ABC. Okay, I'll, I'll have to go have a talk with my mom about why she didn't let me watch it then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, the, so I'm going to guess you guys got to see that and I didn't. Some of it. Some of it. Yeah. didn't watch a lot yeah. of it. But. Yeah. Um, now, there's talk of a of a of a new Indiana Jones movie uh, starring Harrison Ford he is 70 something years old. Given mm-hmm. his age and and things, it would probably take place in the 60s, the 1960s. Mm-hmm. What What do you feel about that? So- it, it's. Is that too much? Too far? Well, time to stop? It, How many times you know, has he gotten hurt on a movie set recently? <laughs> well, and that's and that'd be the question: is would it be more of a, a passing down to the next generation type of thing? Oh, yep. having seen Where Crystal Skull, I can't imagine passing it down to Mutt. I'm sorry. Well, as yeah. long as it's not Sheila LaBeouf again. <laughs> that, I mean, that was the intent. Yeah. There was that Sheila LaBeouf would would t- pick up the the mantle, and well, then first he of all, just you kind of get somebody who actually can act. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm well, not a fan of him. So, <laughs> and who's st- stable? But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, God bless him. But he, yeah, he was he, he kind of that's about the time his he went yeah. off the rails in his and career. No, no pun intended. But there's only so many times you can go to that well. <laughs> right, right. Well, and also, do we want him to hand it off to another generation so that the adventures are taking place in ni- in the sixties and in the seventies? I mean, is is Indiana Jones something that really should be set in the thirties and forties? Yes, yes, <laughs> that is part of the defining milieu of the character. Right. Right. He exists within that time period because that's when you love him. That's it's- when he has clearly delineated bad guys. Because let's face it, gives the Soviets. They ain't Nazis. Right. There's just something about the Nazis that's mm. that that's who you gotta fight, you know? Well, you know, I wonder with with Solo having come out, I wonder if the thought could be too of having another the actor. Origin story. Over. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe or or even just not not so much an origin like the TV show that came out called Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. <laughs> well, yeah. maybe not so much an origin, but maybe well, that, a more adventures of Indiana Jones in his prime. Right, but um, played by obviously by someone else because Harrison Ford is no yeah. longer in his prime by any stretch yeah. of the imagination. I'm not sure Alden Ehrenreich is is. I mean, he's, he was serviceable and fine as Han Solo in Solo, and which we will uh, definitely do a secrets of Solo soon. Uh, but I'm not sure he'd be good as Indiana Jones. But who would you like if you were to pick an, a current actor to play Indiana Jones in his prime? Who? Do you think best embodies that? Given you know, let's 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 just you know st- stipulate that actors can make more of themselves in a role than what they've done in other roles. You know, we we, we get that, but um, I kind of have a I kind of lean toward maybe like even though he's a bit overexposed right now, Chris Pratt has the both the physical and a he's bit got of a the, rakish charm about him. Yeah, and, the, and he's obviously sort got of the humor. comedic. Yeah, he's got the comedic aspect down too. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who else. I mean, um, if the listeners have any names they want to throw up, please feel free to do so on our. Uh, I, I tell you, he's he's funny looking. And he's got two thumbs. This guy. <laughs> right here. Because you want to wear a fedora. Absolutely. And a leather jacket. <laughs> 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 that's right i'm I'm not quite in my prime anymore so i don't i won't throw my won't throw my hat in the ring so to speak um 
Okay, so that's that's enough of that uh, that nonsense. Uh, then then we'll we'll leave it to the uh, listener to to kind of uh, have fun with that game of who should be cast in a reboot of uh, Indiana Jones. I think uh, if they do another one, it should be it should definitely be uh, something based on a, a Judeo Christian <laughs> sort of thing, and I think it should be Indiana Jones and the Excalibur, the search for Excalibur. Okay. All right. Well, that's Western Civ. I don't know if you call that Judeo Christian, but well, there are, there are like- there are versions of the Excalibur story that have definite Christian elements to it. So there's that. But but what do you what do you got? Well, you know, I think that somebody's written that they, they've written several, and I think one of them is the Spear of Destiny. Yep. Right. The spear that was used to pierce the side of Christ on the right, right, cross. That's yep. which was used in the library. Yeah. Right. See, there's your problem there. Noah Wiley will come out of the woodwork going, you can't do that. I mean, Noah Wiley, if you think about it, the librarian is kind of a a modern day version of Indiana Jones. Completely. Except like Indiana Jones and Doctor Who had a love child. Then you end up with the librarian. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the 13th Doctor. Yeah, I was going to say, it can happen with the new Doctor. (laughs) That's what the 13th Doctor goes back to 1936. Never mind. Well, if really you're going to do another Indiana Jones movie, you have to put it after the the Grail episode. You have to put it after that one, The Last Crusade, and you have to put it way before the um, the Crystal Skull. I'm sitting here racking my brain trying to remember well, what year they set the Crystal Skull. Would you necessarily- Indiana Jones and the Invalid Father. That's, yeah. that's, what, the, <laughs> that's what it would be. I, I mean, I don't remember the dates, but would it be necessary to that you couldn't put it in between the current movies? Like, I, I don't remember the exact date. This one was 36 is what yeah, this one, one was like, set at. Well, Temple of Doom was set before right. uh, Raiders. Like 32 or 33, I want to say. Yeah. And then um, and then uh, Lost Crusade was the 40s. Uh, so America you, was in the war. So you could, I mean, there's a lot of time there where if they wanted to do other movies, they could. Right. Yeah, you could fit it into the other, into the rest of that time period. Uh, I'd... So I'll go right and say it. I'd prefer them to recast and and do the movie uh, a movie in that time period as another Indiana Jones adventure, not as an origin, but necessarily, but as just another Indiana Jones adventure. Then I would ha- bring Harrison mm-hmm. Ford out of you know wherever you know whatever. It's not retired, but bringing Harrison Ford back and have him do elderly Indiana Jones. I just uh, I, I'd I, that's how I would feel. Even as a massive fan and as someone who really likes Harrison Ford, I think it's time if we're going to do it again, we gotta we gotta. Might might you might have, have to have a cameo somewhere as a different character and call it good. Right, I'll agree or with that. Be, play his dad. Oh, <laughs> Although no. we'd have to oh, have no, an that, awful that's Scottish Connery, accent. And he's still around. <laughs> Junior. Junior. <laughs> Junior. <laughs> All right. We're already, now we're getting into Last Crusade. It's time to wrap this up because we're going to go on and on and on. Uh, we're already at over an hour and 20 minutes talking about this movie. Oops. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I want to say, you know, the listener, if you've got something you want to add to this or something you want to say about the, our upcoming uh, Secrets of the Temple of Doom and Last Crusade, uh let us know. Send us uh, an uh, email to secrets at sqpn.com. Uh, visit sqpn.com or the SQPN Facebook page. Leave us some feedback. Leave us some comments. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and we'll maybe even play it on a future episode of the show. Uh, you can find links to our personal social media and our websites on our show notes on sqpn.com. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast feed to ensure that you receive all future installments of the secrets of movies and tv shows uh and please like share review and you know spread the word because we're having a lot of fun and i think this is uh something you might enjoy and others will too uh until uh, next time uh mac Barron, thank you for sharing in the secrets of raiders of the lost ark thank you for having me thank you for letting me gush about my favorite movie of all time <laughs> <laughs> shelly kelly thank you as well i really appreciate it thanks tom uh, and thank you, Father Corey. Yeah, glad to be here. And thank you, Dom. Yeah, once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening. And remember, we're simply passing through history, but the Ark is history. <laughs>